here, here is something that you don't need to do when you've been saved. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. What is the first thing that happens when a believer doesn't live for God? They start to wonder why, right? Do you ever wonder why somebody who is saved or professes salvation doesn't live for God? If they're saved, why do they have an addiction? If they're saved, why are they living in sin? Do you know that the first person asked that question is that individual himself? The Bible teaches very clearly that when we don't live for God, we have a hard time knowing that we know Him. Hereby know we that we know Him. Hereby know we that we love God. How? We keep His commandments. You keep God's commandments, and you don't have a hard time believing you're saved. But when you live disobediently and don't walk as a child ought to walk, then you wonder if you're a child. Now, the question is whether or not you are, and Hebrews chapter 5 and 6 very plainly teach that the problem that you're supposed to deal with is not your salvation. Now, here's the, what is happening in the, Hebrew, in the church involving these Hebrew Christians. Many of them have stopped living for the Lord, and now they're going back and asking, was it real? When I got saved, when I turned to Christ, was it real? Did, did I really mean it? Uh, did, I really, um, did I really dedicate myself to the Lord, or was I just faking it? And individuals around them are asking that. If, if you're not living for God now, were you ever saved? Was it ever real? The Bible says that the problem that you're supposed to diagnose is not laying again the foundation for repentance. See, here they are dealing with basic Bible doctrine when the doctrine that they need to know about is how to have spiritual victory. It's a different problem. And here are individuals who are blaming God for their sin. And that's what we're going to find from our text today, and then we'll make some application from it. When you don't live for God, when you don't go on in faith, you're going to be stuck on foundational doctrine. Did, did I choose God or did God choose me? Was I elected to be saved or is it just up to me? And if it's up to me, then could I choose not to be saved later on? And when I, when I don't follow God and I don't live for him, could I, could I say, God, I don't want to be saved any longer? Could I lose my salvation? You see where these, where these foundational doctrines come from? Hey, does the Bible teach very plainly how to get saved? What is it? I mean, I'm telling you something. If you can't read the scripture and see how to be saved, you just don't have much of a brain. And that's a fact. Hey, listen, if you think that salvation is for any other reason than that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that God desires for you to be saved and he promises that if you ask him to save you because of the righteousness of Christ, Jesus, having died for your sins, your sin is placed on Christ and his righteousness is placed on you and it's simply for the asking. I'm telling you, it's simply for the asking. Um, go ahead and write me and argue with me about it. Go ahead and bring all kinds of disputes. I'm telling you, the Bible teaches salvation is for the asking. It's free. It's the gift of God, and you receive it when you say, God, I want to be saved. The Bible teaches that plainly. But you know when people aren't living for God, they start debating how you're actually saved. Well, I know you asked, but did you really mean it? Well, how in the world do you really mean something like, God, I want to be saved? How do you really? Well, by having it be the desire of your heart. Did you want to be saved when you asked? Yes. Now, here's what happens, and the Scripture teaches this very plainly. When you struggle with your salvation because of immaturity, because you haven't gone on in your faith, and you haven't moved forward, what happens is you begin to lay again foundational doctrine, and you begin to deal with whether or not you've ever been saved instead of figuring out how to have victory. And ultimately what the Bible says is that you crucify Jesus afresh and bring him to an open shame. Now, let's look at that. Verse 2. Here's some more of the doctrines that are very basic. By the way, um, listen, you're struggling with the doctrine of baptisms. The Bible's very plain about baptism. Hey, we know what the baptism was in the Old Testament. We know what it represents in the New Testament. All baptism in all contexts is not always the same. You simply look at it in its context and receive it. Believer's baptism is what's practiced in the book of Acts, is what is illustrated in the book of Romans, and that's all a Christian needs to know. Hey, baptism is obedience, and it's very simple. But I want to tell you something. Somebody who is not winning souls, somebody who's not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, is doing so because they don't. They're having a hard time understanding salvation. You have a hard time understanding salvation, you'll have a hard time understanding what baptism represents. And you'll be uh, arguing and debating about it. 
And you'll be laying again these foundations and trying to figure it out. And it's just so simple that you just have to believe what the Bible says, but instead of just believing what the Bible says, you'll be trying to lay again the foundation of it. And then uh, you'll be, you'll be uh, wondering about laying on of hands. Uh, hey, can I lay on hands and people receive the power of the Holy Spirit? And is that real? Is that for today? Is it whatever? The Bible is very plain about it about the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God's Holy Spirit. And if you study your Bible and you study uh, First and Second Corinthians and you study the book of Acts, you can understand the fullness of power and what God's plan for the church of today is. But I want to tell you something. If you're not doing well spiritually, you're going to come up with all kind of nonsense and you'll just be debating it and you'll be uncertain at the very best. Uh, you'll be laying again and that's all you'll want to talk about. Do you just get the picture here that this is all these people want to discuss and debate? What exactly is necessary for salvation? Well, what exactly is believer's baptism? You know, uh, what is baptism in the Bible? What's it represent? And they've all got something different that they think. Um, then, uh, the resurrection of the dead. You know, uh, the, the Pharisee-Sadducee argument again. Is there a resurrection? We know that if we preach that Christ was raised from the dead, then if we are risen with Christ, then if if Jesus was resurrected, and we're going to be resurrected as well. The Bible teaches that very plainly. But these individuals didn't know what happens when you die. Do you just go into the ground? And so you come up with some doctrines like what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe and what individuals who have not gone on the faith teach. False doctrine originates usually in Christianity. False doctrine does not usually originate with lost individuals. It usually originates with immature believers who don't deal with their problem, and that is that they are crucifying Christ on the cross afresh, and they don't have victory over their sin. They haven't gone forward after the cross. And the problem of a believer that wants to hash over these doctrines and eternal judgment and all these things, and is there eternal judgment? Is there a hell? Well, do you think that is a... Oh, hell is a 21st century idea. It's a 1st century idea. It's right here in the Scripture, and there is eternal judgment. But these, they, they, these things always get debated and argued about by individuals that don't want to deal with the real issue. And the real issue is, as outlined in chapter 5, it's spiritual immaturity. Now, let's look at this plainly in our text, and then we'll, we have uh, three areas of application I want to make from it. Um, first of all, here's the statement. We need to go on. We need to leave these principles. And the idea of it isn't rejecting these principles. The idea is moving past these principles. Get, get beyond it, for Pete's sake. Uh, Somebody wants to come to me, and they want to ask me, Pastor, now, I just really want to understand this about salvation. You know what I tell them? Get past it, buddy. You're living in sin. I'm telling you, this truth. I don't argue with them anymore. I used to argue. I used to uh, try to show them things in the Bible. You can't show an immature believer anything. Study 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and if that doesn't settle you on it, you need to move on. I'm serious. You need to mature. You study what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says about the individual who's a natural man, and it is in the context of a believer who has not gone on in the, and they have not matured, spiritually speaking. And you can't argue, you can't convince a Christian who's not what he ought to be of basic Bible doctrine. They're just going to stumble at it and stumble at it and stumble at it. And it's a foundation doctrine, is a principle. Principle means the beginning, right? It's, it's, the principle is the thing that we lay our foundation on, and the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of baptism, doctrine of eternal judgment, the doctrine of, uh, uh, or all the doctrines that are mentioned in chapter 6, these are basic Bible doctrines. They're very basic, and they're for believers. And they're simply to be believed, not to be hashed over and debated about. And I'm telling you, if a person is asking questions and they're having a hard time comprehending these doctrines, it is not because... They, it is not because they cannot understand it. It is because they've got sin in their life and they're immature. It's because they haven't moved on. And if you never get past basic foundational Bible doctrine, if a church never preaches and teaches beyond basic foundational doctrine, you're going to have people that are always debating and always trying to figure out what the truth is. And they're never going to be established and they're never going to move on. And that's what this passage of Scripture is plainly teaching. Now, look at this. This will do. So it says we're supposed to go on. And then the Scripture says in verse 3, this we will do if God permit. And here's a, a, a word of permission if God allows us to. And the idea here is not a matter of uh, can some and can some not. Can some go on and can some not go on? I mean, if you can't go on, then why can't you? That's the question. Okay, so it's a matter of permission, and the qualification is it's an if clause. Now, in the Scripture, when you see an if, we have what is called the protasis and the apotasis. 
Protestus is the first part. 